Let us bow our heads now for a moment of prayer. Most gracious Father, we thank Thee this morning for this privilege of being here in this auditorium, facing the outcome of the day. But we don't know what the day holds, but we know who holds the day. So we pray that He who holds today and tomorrow and all eternity will bless us today as we've assembled together in His name, that we might know better how to live to serve Him. This is our full intention, Father. God, who knows our hearts, knows this truth. We commit ourselves to You with the, the future part of the day for Your service. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Be seated. Here's another one. <clears throat> Good morning, visible audience, and also invisible audience across the nation where we're hooked up this morning. This gives me a great privilege to come here and to speak this morning on this vital subject. <clears throat> To the visible audience, it's indeed a little confusing because there's just in front of me is curtains. Then I have to speak to the right and to the left. And to the invisible audience, I have the auditorium to my right and also the gymnasium to my left. And I'm on the floor with the curtains open between, making my right hand and left hand. And we've got overflow this morning uh, through the auditorium, also the gymnasium, and also the church, church down on 8th and Penn Street. And in the overflow places, the telephone system is taking it down to the other places. We've had a tremendous time in the Lord, and we're under great anticipations for this service this morning. And now, tonight being the closing time of this uh, four days of campaign, why... We certainly invite all that can to be here. We're trusting that the Lord will give us a great climax tonight yes. by doing something extremely extraordinary in so much that He would heal all the sick and do the great things that He usually yes. does. And we're under great anticipations for the evening. The public is cordially invited. Everybody, every church of every denomination, you don't even have to be a Christian, we certainly are calling for sinners to come in, set among us. And we do our very best to teach them what is the way of the Lord that we might live. Now, <clears throat> I hope that the audience will not be nervous. And I'm trusting to God that I will not be nervous. Amen. For I've had a tremendous night a lot of strain, or I realize that the things that I say this morning will be held against me in the day of the judgment. Yes. And I, I couldn't sleep. And I know if I don't say them, it'll be held against me in the day of judgment. So it makes it hard. You can't explain it. And now, this morning is that great subject we're to discuss on marriage and divorce. And the reason I made it Sunday school so that we could talk about it and take our time instead of preaching a sermon on it, it's a teaching from the Scripture. And I, I want to say that if any minister or ministers, any place, should this tape ever fall into their hands if we release this tape, I don't know what the church will do about it, I'm asking Brother Fred to see the church board before he releases this tape. And to you people out across the nation that's got tape recorders setting, please don't let the tape out unless you hear from Brother Sothman about it. Now, and if it is let loose and any of my minister brothers or any Christian anywhere that would disagree upon the things that I am saying about this subject, I, I trust that you will not criticize it. If you don't understand it the way that I teach it, 
Well, you have a right to that as a minister, as a shepherd. And I respect anything that you believe. And there's two great schools on this. And if there's two questions, there's either one of them got to be right or neither one of them's right. So we're going to try to look to the Word of God this morning to settle this. To me, if it's a Bible question, the Bible surely has the answer to it. And now, just before we have these, start this subject, rather, before I pray over the Word, I want to uh, express to each one of you, that I, you Christians especially, that I desire, I, I want you to pray for me this morning. And all out in the unseen audience that's listening in this morning, pray for me. Because I want to be honest and truthful. Now, we realize in making these statements, somebody, if it's only one person, will hang on to it like it was between life and death. There's many of you here who will go away believing. Of course, many of you perhaps want. But I know in my ministry there's people who come to listen at me, listen to what I've got to say from a... Well, they're sitting right here this morning internationally from many of the United States, Canada, and across the seas. And you can imagine the strain that it puts you to know that that man's eternal destination lays in your hands because you go to hold on to what you say. So God would make me answer for it. And I want to approach this just as sincerely as I can. Now, I... I asked our sisters, and I altered some of my words so that I could speak it before them. Billy has in his pockets this morning out there some things that could not be said out before a mixed audience, and some that I probably will say, you must understand, take it as from, the, from your brother. To the best that I know, you'd sit in a doctor's office and listen to him. He'd have to say very plain words to you. And some of you young ladies and young men, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I want you to believe. And just sit still. Remember, truth has got to be stated truth. And now, no doubt, but to be many of you disagree with what is to be said, but I want to prove it to you by the Bible. And then I believe if you'll just be reverent and listen then you'll have a better understanding and conception of what I've been hammering at all along. I believe this will explain it. And I trust that it will. Now, we may be a little lengthy, an hour and a half or maybe longer on this. I don't know how long it will take. And now, again, I would like to say that in this time... That knowing that people hold to your words, they do to their pastor. And of course, I've been a pastor. And they hold to a pastor's words just like it was between death and life. They hold to their priest's words just like it was death and life. And of course, the pastor, perhaps with all that he knows how to do, he's teaching his people just exactly like he was taught in the seminary. No doubt but what the priest also, in the different religions that have priests. Of course, the pastor really is a priest, it's an intercessor. So if uh, the priest and all that he's taught in, his, in the seminary, in the monasteries, a man with deep sincerity is telling just exactly what he's taught, well, then I don't have any seminary experience or monastery experience and nothing against it at all. But I have a very peculiar life. I was called when I was just a little boy. And in this was a visible, audible sign given me uh, a pillar of fire hanging in a bush at seven years old, right here on the Utica Pike. My father was working for Mr. O.H. Watt, and had just recently died. And you've read the book. You know the story. And from that time, down on the river, then it appeared visibly before the people. And now, it's had the picture taken many times. 
and it hangs in the Washington, D.C. as a copyright in the Religious Hall of Art as the only supernatural being that was ever scientifically proven to be photographed. Same pillar of fire, exactly the same look and every way that brought Israel out of Egypt. I believe it's Jesus Christ in spirit form, in the sonship of God. For he was called Son of Man when he come first. Now he's called Son of God. In the millennium, he'll be Son of David. He comes Son of Man, a prophet, as was spoke of him. Now he's Son of God, supernatural. In the great millennium is to come, he'll be son of David, sitting on the throne of David. As all Bible readers know, that that's a divine promise. Well, God to David, he'd raise up his son to sit on his throne. And now, in an odd, peculiar ministry, I've been called everything from God to a devil. And that just, it always is that way. That's what this archbishop of the Catholic Church Church said to me the other night, down there the discussion was, that he said, Brother Branham, John the Baptist clearly identified himself in the scriptures as spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He said, your ministry is clearly identified in the church. He said, the Lutherans are in the Bible. He said, Lutherans know Luther. Wesley's know Wesley, but what about the Pentecostals? Amen. said, they're wandering, don't know where to go. And I said, sir, I appreciate that. And it's that time the Spirit fell upon the lady, had never seen me, his wife, and spoke and identified the same things. Now, to be honest, before this message I speak this morning, I don't know. I told him, I said, sir, I couldn't say that. That's a great big thing to say. It looks like it. One thing that I know that there's something has took place. Yes. Definitely. All these things just as scientifically proven and proven around and around the world, it can't be just a myth, it's truth. Right. What is it? Let me say confessionally before I speak to you this morning, I don't know. And I would be daring to make any move until I heard from him that has talked to me in the past and told me these things. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ never did identify himself as the Son of God. He said, you said I was, to this end I was born, and so forth. But he never identified himself. And now, that was the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, was the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit form. You believe that? The Logos that went out of God. And then when he was on earth, he said, I come from God and I go to God. We all know that. And after his death, burial, and resurrection, Saul of Tarsus was on his road down to Damascus to persecute the, the Christians because they were teaching things contrary to what they had been taught. And he was a great warrior under Gamaliel, one of the outstanding teachers of the day in their school, their monastery, and a great man and an officer of the church. And it was there that a great light, the pillar of fire again, struck him down in the middle of the day. And a voice said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, if you notice, when Paul, Saul raised up, he said, Lord, who are you? Now, that boy being a Jew, he certainly wouldn't have called anything unless it had been something to symbol God. He wouldn't have called it Lord. So it was the same pillar of fire. And Jesus said, I go to God. I came from God and I returned to God. There he was, back in the form of a pillar of fire again. He said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest, and it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And we realize that when the apostle Peter, to whom the keys was given, to build the church, we find out that he was in prison, and this same pillar of fire came through the bars, opened the doors of the prison, and took Peter out mysteriously, without even disturbing the guards. To me, it's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then you'll always know anything by the nature of it. Anything is known by its nature, the fruit it bears. And I ask you to watch the kind of fruit it bears, this light. 
which is God because it always goes back to the Word of God and proves the Word of God, preaches the Word of God, and God proves that Word materially so before you. There's got to be something behind it. People have called me a prophet. I don't call myself no prophet because I'd be daring to say that. But I, have say, I can say this, that the Lord has let me foresee things, tell things that has happened, will happen, is happening, and not one time has it ever failed in the tens of thousands of times. Amen. Everything Amen. that he said would happen, happened. Yeah. Right. We all know that. Amen. If there's a person in this visible audience this morning or anywhere can say one time it failed, you're at liberty to stand up and say so. But if everybody knows that every time of the thousands of times has been perfectly right, say amen. Amen. So that would be the same thing around the world. Something is just about to happen. God never sends these things without being a purpose behind it. I was just thinking, here I placed it here, one of my notes, that I'm wearing this morning a um, set of cufflinks. And many of you have heard of this movie star Jane Russell and her mother is a Pentecostal and Danny Henry is her cousin her first cousin her mother's sister's child he was Baptist he was standing at the meeting a businessman's meeting in Los Angeles California two years ago and I just got through speaking of a great powerful forceful statements that even the overseer, one of the general overseers of the Assemblies of God, stepped down to the platform from up in the balcony of where he was sitting, and he said, I don't believe it, Brother Branham meant that. I said, I have to mean it, sir. It's thus saith the Lord. And then it's about the church in this age. And about that time, this young man, who is a businessman, his brother is over, he, t- he was there taking uh, pictures for television that morning, his other brother is, is a state road supervisor of California. And Danny Henry walked forward after the meeting was closed on the platform like this where the men were all seated, walked down to put his arms around me, and he said these words, Brother Branham, I hope this don't sound sacrilegious, but said that could be made the 23rd chapter of Revelations, which is only 22 chapters in Revelations. He said, I hope this don't sound sacrilegious. He had no more and said it. Now, the boy was a Baptist and knew nothing about the supernatural. With his arms around me, he started talking in an unknown language. And when he got through speaking in an unknown language, there was a, a heavy set, dark woman sitting right in front of me. She raised up, said, that don't need any interpretation. She said, I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana, or Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Said, that is clearly French. Victor Le Duc which was a Frenchman, also sitting up there, said, certainly I'm a Frenchman. And that was perfectly French. I said, wait a minute. You write down what he said and you write down what he said. Before you say anything, write down what you said and let's see your notes. And so one wrote down and the other wrote down. It was even the punctuation was the same. And then just about that time when they brought the notes up, a fine looking young Blonde-headed boy come walking from the back where there's not enough room for him to sit down. He was standing up in the back. He come walking forth. Said, just a minute, I'd like to place a note too. He said, I am the French interpreter for the UN. United Nations. He said, I'd like to leave my note. And here are all three notes exactly the same. A French. And here's the way it reads. This is the original notes, take a note taken right off. This is Danny's note himself. He packed in his pocket. Of course, it went to the Christian businessman and so forth. Because thou hast chosen the narrow path, the harder way, thou hast walked in your own choosing, thou hast picked the correct and precise uh, decision, and it is my way. Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven will await thee. What a glorious decision thou hast made. This in itself is that which will give and make come to pass 
their tremendous victory in the love divine. Now, the man signed his name here. The above statement was interpreted by, uh, of Danny Henry prophesying over Brother Branham, given by three witnesses in the um, uh, cafeteria in Los Angeles, California. Now, this same young man that gave this prophecy, not knowing what he was saying, was in Jerusalem about a month ago. He had the privilege of going out and, and laying in the tomb where Jesus had died and was buried. And so while he was laying there, he said, I come up on his mind real strong. And he started weeping. He said, how that it has been so hard for Brother Branham to stand against the world and these things in all churches. Like as it was once said of one of the Billy Graham parts that we can see Billy Graham because all churches are united together for him. We see old Roberts, the Pentecostals. But how do we ever have anything when it's contrary to what people are being taught? It's God. And Danny, what he does for a hobby, he makes little stones. He walked out to where the cross had been put down, where they said the cross set in the rock. No one was around, so he broke off a little piece of rock. And he put it in his pocket for a souvenir, come home and made me a pair of cufflinks out of it. And strangely, when he made them, they look to be blood-stained, and right through each one of them in continuity runs a straight, narrow path right through both of them. Right. Now, that might be just, um, uh, see, I, someone else might not notice it, but to me it's complementary to the things I believe. I believe that everything has a meaning to it. And now, in this time, whatever the Lord has, uh, if this isn't the thing that he prophesied of a Malachi for... And of also of Luke 17 and many other scriptures that's to happen in this last day. May I say this in closing? It's laid the foundation for the man when he will come. So I am very thankful that God Almighty, if it's be that way, has let me do a little something in my uneducated condition to show my appreciations of his love to me, my love to him and our love to the people. Therefore, in sincerity, I approach this subject of marriage and divorce. May Amen. God have mercy on us all. Amen. And now, listen closely. And sisters, don't get up and go out. Sit still just a little while. Brothers, do the same. Don't turn off your sets out there that's coming on this hookup. Don't do that. Just sit still for a few minutes until it's over. Listen closely. If you disagree... Put down the scriptures that I use and then study them prayerfully before you make your decision. God help us as we try to approach this subject. Now, it may be a little lengthy. I don't want you to be in any hurry. And uh, just take your time, all of us, and study the Word of God truly and thoroughly as we know how to study it. Let's begin with St. Matthew, the 19th chapter. And beginning, I think, with the 8th verse of the 19th chapter, I wish to start. I might start also with the first and read down to the 8th verse of the 19th chapter. Now remember, these things that I say must come from the Word of God. It can't be my own opinion. Because my opinion just like anybody else's. But it's got to be in continuity with the Word of God. Remember, God keeps everything in continuity. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that? He's the same. Now I shall read from the 19th chapter. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these things, He departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. I pause there so you get the emphasis on who it was that was tempting him. Saying unto him, 
Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Therefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. They said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Now, God help us. This scripture, this question, confronted Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry. And it confronted Moses at the very beginning of his ministry. It's a foremost question in believers' hearts. The sinner doesn't care. But it's to believers because... The believer is trying to do all that he knows how to do to live right before God. Therefore, if any question comes up on religion, then the marriage and divorce case comes up. Why? Because it is the cause of the original sin. That's where sin started. And that's the reason it's brought up every time, because it is the very beginning of sin. Now, I won't have time to explain all these things, but I'll be glad to answer your letter or anything I can. We've got the books wrote on it and many questions and even uh, cuttings out of newspapers and things here to prove this. We know that it was Eve, the apple that she was supposed to eat, or it's not even scriptural. Now they claim it was an apricot. It was neither one. She committed adultery. It brought forth the first child, which was Cain, Satan's own son. For in him laid evil. It did not come through Abel. Satan's son was Cain. I know your question now. He said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That's exactly right. You could take the honorest woman in the town, the worst man. If they had a baby, it would have to come from the Lord. Because God has laws set together. And I, these laws, like the sun to raise, you put a cucklebur in a good field, it'll grow. And it has to grow because it's God's law. When seed is planted, it must grow. And nothing can grow life but God, because it operates under His laws. Therefore, when the evil seed was planted in the womb of, of Eve, it had to bring forth because it's God's law yes. of production. And it could do nothing else but bring it, and it had to come from God. That's the reason people say, little baby, sometimes it's not born with Christian parents or lost. Jesus Christ's blood atones for the child. I don't care how much it was born, how evil it was born. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The little child cannot repent because it has nothing to repent for. And that was the sin of the world which was taken away by the blood of Christ. Babies go to heaven. It's original sin and that's the reason. It's, it's question. When any great phenomena comes from God, but the first thing, what about marriage and divorce? Now as ever, it still is a question amongst the people. As it was in the times of Jesus, as it was in the times of Moses, it's always been and is to this day a question among the people because the people want to know what's the truth. But where there is a question, there must also be an answer. And now, being an answer, as I've said before this week, there must be a correct answer. 
And if we get an answer to anything, and it, uh, it isn't right, uh, then we know that it was wrong. But there's, we're still asked until the true question is answered. If you want to know truth. And being this is a Bible question, it should be a Bible answer. It's like I said, if I wanted to go east this morning, and the best that I know this, I had to find a certain something in the field, and it was directly east, and I went east. Somebody said, Brother Branham, this is east. It is east, potentially, but it's northeast. I would pass the very object I was looking for. I'd come back knowing it was wrong. And then if somebody said, Brother Bram, go this way to your right. Now, that is potentially east also, but it's southeast. I would lose the object that I was looking for because I went beyond the boundaries of the perfect and direct way. Now, if that be so, we have two schools of thought on marriage and divorce. And that is, one of them says that a man can only be married once unless his wife is dead. That's one of the questions. But you go to following that, you go overboard. And then the next says, oh, if the wife or the husband, either one has committed adultery, either one of them can be put away and married again. You find yourself overboard with that. So, see, it's neither southeast or northeast. We want directly east. You run out of Scripture when you go this way. You run out of Scripture when you go that way. We want to know where Scripture meets Scripture. And know what's the truth of it. Each takes a different way. And fail to bring up the correct answer, but there still must be an answer. It's just like today. There's two great schools of doctrine in the church. One of them is Calvinism. The other is Arminianism. One of them is legalist. The other one's grace. And we come to find out that the people who believe in grace, the Calvinists, they say, bless God, it don't hurt me to smoke. It don't hurt me to drink. I can do these things. I've got eternal security. Then we find the other side on the legalist said, Oh, I would like to ball him out. I'd like to show him a piece of my mind. But I'm a Christian. I have to keep still. See, you find yourself on two different roads. And neither one of them is right. Now, that's hard to say that. But it is the truth. We find ourselves on two different roads. One going one way, one another. Now, let's t- see what truth is. Now listen and see if this sounds sensible to you. For instance, if I get ready to go overseas, and I'll take my own family. I'll call my wife up to me, and I will say, uh, we're go- I'm going overseas, dear. Now here is the legalist side. Now my wife, I'm going to lay the law down to you. If you flirt with any man while I'm gone, when I come back, you're a divorced woman. And I don't want you making eyes. I don't want you flirting. You understand that? I'm your husband. If you do it, I'm going to put you away when I come back. Then she reaches and gets me by the tie and say, My good man, I want to tell you something. <laughs> that if you make eyes at any woman or take any woman out or flirt with any woman, you're going to be a divorced man when you come back. Now, wouldn't that be a happy home? That's a legalist. All right. Now the other side is that if I go overseas and uh, uh, make a mistake, go over and say, when I look, I take this woman out. Oh, it's all right. My wife, she don't care. My wife said, I go out with this man. It's all right, Bill. He don't care. If I don't care, then there's something wrong with me. I don't love that woman right. And if she don't care, there's something wrong with her. She's my wife. I don't want other men fooling with her. She's my wife. Now, the correct way of it is, is both of them's got a truth, but not the exact truth. 
Now, when I go overseas to make it right, my little family gathers around and we pray with one another. And I commit them to God and they commit me to God. And when we do, we go overseas. I go overseas. Now, I know she loves me. I have confidence in her. And I love her. She's got confidence in me. As long as I love her like that, she don't have any worry about me taking any other woman out. As long as she loves me right, while well, there's no me, me thinking about any other man going out with her. Because she's my wife. And I believe her. I believe if I would actually do something wrong, make a mistake, and go out with some woman, and return back and would confess it to her and tell her, Meaty, I didn't mean to do that. I just got caught in a trap. This woman just run right up to me and, and, and uh, grabbed me by the arm and started so and so. I believe she'd be understanding. I believe she would forgive me for it. But I wouldn't do it for nothing. Because I love her. Though she would forgive me, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't hurt her for nothing. Though I know she'd forgive me for it, I don't want to hurt her. And that's the way it is with God. If I, if a filial love, which is human love, fellowship love, can make a man feel that about his wife, what about agapo love? The Greek word meaning the love of God. How would that make me do about Jesus Christ? Amen. I, if long as I want to go do it, it's in my heart to do it. Whether it, I say as long as it's in my heart to do it, I, I go do it. Legalism won't let me do it. It's because I know that I get punished for doing it. But the real truth of it is, it's when the love of God comes into your heart to you want to do it. That's the truth of it. There's the two schools. Not legalism or other. Or the Calvinism. It's both. Now, we find out today, also there's many different denominations. There's the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church. Each one of them says they're the way. See, we have the way. We're the truth. There's the Methodist says we have the truth. The Baptist says we have the truth. Well, to me... As long as they feel that way, it's not so. Because Jesus said, I am the truth. Amen. See? Therefore, as my sermon last night was, that He is the place where God put His name, the only place to worship. You are not a Christian because you're a Protestant. You're not a Christian because you're a Catholic. You're not a Christian because you're Methodist, Baptist, or Pentecostal. You are a Christian because you've been baptized into Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Not by water. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. That's Holy Spirit baptism. Amen. Water baptism inducts you into a fellowship, but Holy Spirit baptism inducts you into Christ. There's the truth. We have also two thoughts of this marriage and divorce. Now that our Lord has opened the seven seal mystery of His Word to us in this last days. Now, many of you, this might be Greek to you, but my church understands well, what well, you've served the visions and what's taken place. And the question is a Bible question. We are invited here to believe there must be a true answer to the whole hidden secret that's been hid since the foundation of the world. And the Bible prophesies and says that in this day these secrets would be made known. Right. Amen. Revelations 10. And at the sounding of the seventh angel, the lady will see a messenger. The mysteries of God would be made known. And this is the last age, which is Laodicea. Look at all this revival. has went on for 15 years or more. Not one denomination come out of it. Luther had a revival. There went a denomination. Wesley, there went a denomination. Alexander Campbell, there went a denomination. All these other great John Smith and so forth denominations. Moody, all along. But here's been one, usually a revival only lasts about three years. But this has been going for over 15 years and not one denomination has sprung up from it. For this is a seed time. There's no more shuck. After the one shuck's gone, it's seed. God is ready. If He isn't doing it now, He's going to call a church to perfection by His Word, Jesus Christ. 
Notice, there must be an answer somewhere. And being that the seven sealed mystery of God, seven seals. How many understands that? Raise up your hands. You see, I think most of them is our congregation from around. Listen, if not, the books will be out pretty soon upon the subject. We have books, some books on it now. Jesus, in our text, invites us to go back to the beginning for the true scriptural answer. Now, when he was confronted with this, there was two things in view. The priest said to him, Can a man put away his wife, marry another for any cause? And Jesus said, It wasn't so from the beginning. Then they said, Moses suffered us a writing of divorcement and to put away for anything they wanted to. He said that Moses did that because, I'm letting that straight a while, because of the hardness of your hearts. But from or at the beginning, it wasn't so. The question, the question today like a world peace, is it coming by politics, union of nations, united? I say to you, nay. It's always failed and it will again. But there remains a true answer to the question. Will there be peace upon the earth? Yes, when sin is ridden off of the earth, there will be peace. Amen. But until that time, there will be no peace. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. God gave a remedy for sin. Listen close now. God gave the remedy to rid sin off the earth. But man of the earth won't accept God's remedy. God gave us a remedy and a way to marry our wives and live with them. But man won't accept God's remedy. Won't accept His Word on it. Jesus has said, this, and this reminds us of, of His words, knowing that He said, heavens and earth will fail, pass away, but mine won't. The question, the true answer that Jesus wants us to go back to is to go back to the beginning. And that would be in Genesis. Because the word Genesis is the seed chapter to every question in the Bible. And you always have to go back to the seed to see what kind of a seed's in a field to find out what your crops will be. Now, what kind of seed is sown? Genesis being the seed chapter, we go back to Genesis, Jesus introduces us to that Scripture at the beginning. Now remember, that's when time started to begin. Before that, it was eternity. Now, our question there was, notice, if we go back to the beginning, now, don't fail this. And that's the reason I want to talk slow so that the people out on the wires and that the tape will say it clearly. If Jesus said, go back to the beginning, there was only one pair of anything on earth. There was one Adam, one Eve. They were joined by God alone. One female horse, one male. One female parrot, one male. At the beginning... As he told us to go back, there was only one pair of anything. Is that true? Right. Amen. Then we find out that everything in the beginning was running in perfect order and harmony with God. Nothing was out of cater. Everything in the heavens still in order. All the stars, the galaxies, the solar system, everything is perfectly in order. One of them moved would interrupt the whole program. 
Now, listen. Do you see one interruption spoils the entire program? Now, when human beings was running in continuity with God, with one man and one woman, this woman sinned. And it drove the whole earthly program out of continuity with God. Therefore, one word added to this book, or one word taken from it, throws a Christian out of continuity with God. Throws a church out of continuity with God. Throws a family out of continuity with God. Every believer can be thrown out by not accepting every word of God. Then it was the woman that caused the separation of the lovely home. It was not a cherubim that bothered the earth. It was not Adam that throwed the home out. It was not anything else that drove the home out and drove the whole thing out of continuity, but a woman, Eve. And it is here that the beginning that Jesus spoke of was broken. Jesus said, at the beginning, God made one male, one female of each kind. And now, when this woman, not the female horse, not the female dog, but the woman, she broke the entire continuity of God's operation on the earth and throwed everything into death. The woman, not the man, she broke the covenant. She broke the covenant because why? She stepped across the borders of God's Word. Now, if she broke her covenant with her husband, she broke her covenant with God, then because she broke the covenant of God, she broke it with her husband. And when you break your promise and your covenant to God's Word. That's what caused so many illegitimate church members. Because a group of men got together and said, well, it didn't mean that. And it throws the whole organization out of continuity with the Word. Uh, we don't believe that Dr. Jones said it wasn't so. But as long as God said it so, He said, let every man's Word be a lie and mine be the truth. There breaks the continuity. Now, we see, being that the continuity is broken, then the lifeline was broken. Also, the timeline was broken. The covenant was broken. Everything shattered. What caused it? A woman. That's what broke the covenant. Now, if you want to read that, you can read it. Genesis 3. Now, it was then man was made to rule over the woman by God's Word. She was no more co-equal with him. She was co-equal in nature, you know. But when she broke God's Word, God made a man to be a ruler over her. Amen. Genesis 3.16, if you want to put it down. She was no more equal with the man. She was a breaker of God's Word. Don't you see? She, she, the church down here, the breaker of God's Word that threw her completely out of continuity. And that's what the church has done and thrown spiritual death upon the whole thing. Now you'll understand why I hammered these things like I do. It's truth. This is Bible facts. 
Notice, why did she do such a thing as this? How could that lovely, beautiful, perfect woman... I seen a picture one time, I believe it was in Greece, of an artist that painted a picture of Eve. She was the most hard-looking thing I'd ever seen. That shows what a carnal mind can look at. But she wasn't. She was beautiful. Of course, she was perfect woman, all woman. Notice, why did she do such a thing being in that high order? She was right with man, co-equal with him. But we all know now that she well, lost her co-equalness with man when she sinned. And God said, man will be your ruler from here out. Amen. Now, that's the Scripture. If you want to, we could read it. I'm giving you the Scripture, so save time for this big hookup across the country that you might read it yourself. Notice the reason she did that. How did Satan ever get to her? Did you know Satan was co-equal with God one day? Sure was. All but a creator. He was everything. Stood at the right hand of God in the heavens, a great leading cherubim. Notice, the reason that she did this, she was not in the original creation. Amen. Amen. She is not in God's original creation. She is a byproduct. Therefore, at the beginning, as Jesus referred to it, she was not a original creative being of God. She's a byproduct of a man. When Jesus referred to the beginning. Remember... Adam was both masculine and feminine in the original creation, one. But then he was separated by a rib. Notice, but a byproduct, and notice the only one of all God's creation of every animal and anything else, she was the only one designed this way. Every other female was in the original creation. Every other female was in the original creation. But Eve was not in the original creation. See, that had to be made that way. We'll get to it after a while. Notice in this creation she was in, not in the original, but a byproduct. And in this creation, there is... Now, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I want to tell you the truth and you just sit still, you're doing nice. There is nothing designed to be so deceitful as a woman. It's deceitful. There cannot be nothing else. There's nothing made to be that way. Also... There is nothing that can be so easily deceived as a woman. Amen. Now, the fall proves this statement to be true. Amen. The fall in the beginning. She was not in the original beginning creation. She was in Adam. But not in a female set herself at the beginning. She was a byproduct made. Now, there's nothing designed that can deceive and be deceived as easy as a woman. There is nothing designed or can stoop as low as a woman can. Think now. There's nothing designed in all creation that can stoop as low as a woman can. She can tear a man's heart to pieces easier than anything else there is in the world. Right. Is his wife. Let it, that nice little wife get to run around some other man. Look at that fellow sitting there with his children, a tears dropping out of his eyes. Amen. 
She is designed that way. She is designed to do this. There is no hog, no dog, or no other animal designed like her or can stoop as low as she can stoop. Now, that is true. Yes. Amen. With regards to my sisters, I just want you to watch. No animal can be immoral. You call the dog a slut, the female dog. You call the male hog a sow. But her morals is a million miles beyond many Hollywood stars. Yes. Right. That's how low she's designed to stoop. She can't... Just think of this now. There's nothing in the world made in God's creation that can be immoral. Stoop that low. You say, wait a minute, man. We're going to get to that. The woman has to say yes. Notice, there's nothing designed to stoop so low or be filthy but a woman. A dog can't do it. A hog can't do it. A bird can't do it. No animal is immoral, nor it can be. For it is not designed, so it can be. A female hog can't be immoral. A female dog can't be immoral. A female bird can't be immoral. A woman is the only thing can do it. I see where Satan went. See? But still, she has, she's once got the power to say yes or no. See? Depends on where she wants to hold herself. See? Now, here we can see plainly the serpent seed where it come in. Yes. There's only one place he could go to. Amen. That wouldn't nail it down. Somebody's blind. That's right. It had to go to that. Notice, the reason that animals couldn't do it, a female animal, they were in the original creation. But the woman was not in that original creation. Now we're going back to dig this up and then bring it right down to the modern day in the Testament. She is designed alone for filth and unclean living. A dog can. No other female can. It's just the woman that can. A dog or any other animals wants to hear in that for her babies. Not for sexual pleasure, but for her babies. The old sow hog, the old slut dog, once a year, one moment, that's for her babies. But a woman is designed for any time she desires. I've got some stuff crossed out here now. You can imagine the rest. A dog can't, woman can I hope that the Holy Spirit reveals you the rest of this I crossed out here. She is the only species, species of female that is made prettier than the male. There's not another species among anything. All other creatures of God is beautiful males, such as in animals, birds, and so forth. Always the male is pretty. Look at the big buck deer, big fine horns, great species, and the little humble doe. Look at the big rooster with all his pretty feathers and the little brown hen. Look at the birds, the cock and the hen. Why? Why was it such of all the creatures of God? Every creature in the male is the prettiest. Between the sheep, between the, the hogs, between the horses, between anything else, it's always the big male that's pretty. And in the birds. But in the human race, it's the woman that's pretty. Not the man. If he is, he's something wrong. 
It's crossed up seed somewhere. Amen. Originally, it's that way. Why? Why was it done? To deceive by. Her designer, Satan, is still working on her, too, in these last days. Let me stop here just for a moment. Pretty. Did you know at the first destruction internationally of the world or worldwide was because of pretty women? When the sons of God saw the daughters of man were fair, they taken unto them women. Is that right? Have you noticed the increase of beauty of women in this day? I have seen the picture of Pearl Bryant which is supposed to be the prettiest woman in the nation at one time. There isn't a teenage girl in this school, but what would outshadow her when it comes to beauty? The increase of the beauty of women is showing the time of deception. When did the church look any more prettier than it does today? (laughs) Everything is... Featuring great, big, fine buildings and millions of this and millions of that. Don't you see? See the deception. Now, there's nothing can stoop like her. And she is designed so that she can be deceiving. And Satan is really working on her today in these last days. Because he is her designer. I can prove that now to go right back at the beginning. Who started to work on her? Adam or Satan? God or Satan? See? That's her designer. It's her chief weapon to throw man to her filth. Being a pretty woman, she can sway a man any way she wants to. Brother, it ain't a bootleg joint down here gets the man. It's a pretty woman walking down the street twisting herself half-dressed. That's what takes... That's the deceiver right there. And she's deadly with it. Absolutely deadly. You may question me about Satan being her designer. But that's the truth. Satan designed her. He still does it. Let me show you something in the Scripture. I've got to take it back to Scripture and you draw your opinion as you look at it today. Satan is the one who features that kind of beauty. If we'll notice, he was the most beautiful of all the angels in heaven. Is that right? And he desired to make heaven a more beautiful place than the kingdom of Michael. Is that right? Also, to show that Cain was his son, he offered a more beautiful worship, decorated his altars with fruits and flowers and so forth. Is that right? Beautiful. Sin is beautiful. What we call beauty today. And sin is deceiving by beauty. You never look at a woman going down the street and tell what's in her heart. See? See? But I want to say these things so that you can see why that Satan is her designer. It's exactly right. His own son proved it. King. Now, she's beautiful so she can deceive. The world is beautiful so it can deceive. I mean cosmos, the order of the world. It's beautiful so it can deceive great, fine places and luxury Remember the prophet Amos when he come up over and looked down into the city and seen it like a modern Hollywood, his little old eyes got little under that gray hair hanging in his face. And he walked down there with a message and burst out on that place. He said, the very God that you claim to serve will destroy you. Right. Sin. It's pretty. They picture Judas as some old drunken sot out here on the street somewhere, mouth hanging with flies in it and so forth. At Judas, Judas was handsome, strong, a deceiver. 
It ain't that guy to watch around you. It ain't a guy that the old farmer come in with a pair of overhauls on to watch around your wife. It's that slicker. He's the rascal. Sin is beautiful to the eyes of the world. But God is not featured in that kind of beauty. Do you know that? God is featured in character. Beautiful character. In the Bible, Isaiah 53, if you want to put the Scripture down. It's got rolls of Scripture wrote on the side here for it. Isaiah 53, the Bible said of our Lord Jesus that there was no beauty that we should desire Him. And we hid as it was our faces from Him. Is that right? We didn't desire Him because He wasn't pretty. He's probably a little fellow, stoop-shouldered, ruddy-looking. And he wasn't desirable to be a leader. He didn't look like a leader. Talk with common street talk and so forth like the people does, the common people. So therefore, he didn't look like he's any great scholar, educated, fine, all robed up and everything. He was just an ordinary man. There was no beauty of him that we should desire him. He walked in and out a man right along. They didn't even know who he was. He didn't look like a God walking along, what we'd think was a God. But the same he was. Did you notice when the Lord God said to to Samuel, go up to the house of Jesse and anoint one of his sons king to take Saul's place. Now, the people chose Saul when Samuel absolutely told him not to do it. He said, God don't want you to have a king. He's your king. And said, have I ever said anything to you in the name of the Lord, but what come to pass? Have I ever begged you for money or something other from a living? They said, no, you never begged us for money. And whatever you said in the name of the Lord, it come to pass, but we want the king anyhow. So they chose Saul. Look what the world chose. Look what Israel chose. Israel, God's anointed. They chose a man that was head and shoulders above any man in the nation. Great, big, fine, handsome looking fella. And he always was a fly in the ointment. But God said, I'm going to choose you a king to my choosing. So he said, Samuel, I ain't going to tell you who he is, but you go up there. He's one of Jesse's sons. Jesse... His wife and all of them looked around and said, Yes, our oldest son. He's a great, tall, handsome man. He'll look just right for the king's crown. He's smart. He's educated. He's a fine man. I know he'll be just right. He speaks his word proper. When they brought him out, Samuel took the crucible oil and went towards him. He said, No, the Lord refused him. <laughs> so he went all the way down to six sons. And the Lord refused every one of them. He said, Isn't there another one? Oh, he said, Yes, there's one. He's back out there herding the sheep. He just sits back there and plays songs and sings it and shouts and goes on. But he's a little old stooped, shouldered, ruddy looking guy. He would never make a king. He said, go get him. And while David come in the sight of the prophet, the prophet run with the oil and poured it up on his head and said, this is God's chosen. Not pretty. But character. God looks at character. Man looks at natural beauty. It's deceiving. That's why a woman was given that beauty for deception. To deceive. A beautiful woman, if she don't use it in the right way, it's a curse to her. That'll send her to hell quicker than anything else I know of. If she just... If she can be pretty, sure, as long as she stays with her husband and does what's right, and that, that's fine and dandy. But she can take that same thing and, my, how she can deceive with it. For it was given to her to do so. Notice. Now, but God is featured in character. There was no beauty we should desire Jesus, but there never was a character like Him on the earth. Hallelujah. Now, we find out today that uh, the church character 
Satan and his group look after big, beautiful churches, beautiful things. That's what the world looks at today. Oh, it's a pastor, the great so-and-so times so-and-so, so priestly and godly walking out in these big robes and things like that. They call that beauty. But the real saints of God looks for the character of the vindicated Word. That's what the saints did in that day when they seen Jesus. He was nothing to look at, but they seen God was in him. They seen God was with him. That's how that those... Uh, Joab and those characters with David, a little old fellow, but they seen the, the man was in him. They seen that God was in him and they know he was coming into power someday. They once slew them with the five brothers of Goliath, single-handed. One killed 300 men when some women was picking some beans for dinner. And their army had gone away and he took a spear and killed 300 men. Philistines. Character. Why? They stayed right by David. They know the anointing was up on him. Yeah. And they know he was coming into power. Hallelujah. A pure picture of the church today that will stand by the Word. Yeah. We know it's going to be made vindicated. We know it's coming into power someday. Right. Although Saul, he was a fugitive from the rest of the nations. But they know he was coming into power. We know he's coming into power too. So we take that Word and stand right there. Yeah. No matter what it costs. We have to cut Philistines or jump in a pit and kill a lion as one did. We go anyhow, because it's so, that's the way God designed it to be. We look for character. You may now ask me, why did he permit her to be designed thus? I don't want to take too much time because I've got a lot more to say here. Why? The question might arise then, why did God make this woman like this? Why did he permit her to be like that? It was for his own good pleasure. Sure. Now, if you want to turn in your Bible just a minute, let's turn to Romans 9 just a minute and show you something how God does these things. If you want to, to read it. And we can see here what God does for his own good pleasure. A Romans 9, 14. Then what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness before God when he chose Esau or chose Jacob and rejected Esau before either boy could have a right to make a choice himself? Neither one of them before they was born still in the womb of the mother. God said, I hate Esau and I love Jacob. See? Why? For he said unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not him that willeth nor him that runneth, but it's God that showeth mercy. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he, now watch here, for he a mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, uh, why then does he find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but O oh man, who art thou that rileth against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me this? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel to honor and the other to dishonor? What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endures such long sufferings, the vessel of wrath fitted to destructions, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessel of mercy which he has afore prepared unto glory? Please. Now are you that a while? Amen. God did it. He had to make it this way. It had to be there. Now listen. Now for about five minutes, I want to call your attention to something. What is God? God is a great eternal. At the beginning, way back before there was a beginning, He wasn't even God. Did you know that? God's an object of worship and there was nothing to worship Him. He lived alone. And in Him was attributes. 
What is an attribute? A thought. Now you'll get something that'll border on the lesson for tonight. Notice, he was his attributes that was in him. Now it was in him to be Father. It was in him to be God. It was in him to be Son. It was in him to be Savior. It was in him to be Healer. And all these things here are just displaying his attributes. There's nothing out of order. You think God didn't see the end from the beginning? Certainly he did. There's nothing out of order. It's just displaying his attributes. Now, he could not be just and make a man to fall. He had to put him on equal basis of free moral agency to make his own choice, but knowing he would fall. Now, he can't be a savior unless something's lost. He can't be a healer unless something's sick. Amen. These things had to be that way. God made him thus so that his great attributes could be displayed. If there wasn't that, he had never been a savior, but we know he was, even before there was a time, he was a savior. He was a savior. So there has to be something lost. How's it going to be? If he takes and loses it just in order to save it, then it isn't justice to his judgment. He couldn't send a man to hell and be just. He's kind, gentle, true, honest. And he's a great judge. See, he'd be working against himself. So he had to put a man out here and make him on free moral agency so he would, knowing, would fall. And the man in his own image, how could he fall? <laughs> now you see in daylight? So he had to make a byproduct. Something out of the original creation. Amen. Now you see it, see? There you come. See? Then that's what fell. He made it knowing it would fall. And he's put over the hands of Satan for a vessel of dishonor. Where's honor bestowed today? You think on that. Notice. Closely now. Then again, why she was designed this way and not like other females? Why was the woman designed so and not other females? No, the other females are designed like that. They're not today. They can't. Not being made that way. She can't do it. Why did he not make this female then, a woman, just like other females, so she'd just be the same way? Could just raise her babies. Then she'd have her husband live, and when it come time for a baby, she'd have her baby. Why, why do you make her like this? I can't say these words, and you understand what I'm talking about, don't you? If you can understand, say amen. amen. You know, see, uh, it's young girls sitting here and young boys. Eh? But you know, the animal has to come to a certain time of the year, then her mate, then that's all. But a woman is any time. Why did he make her like this? Now watch this great program unfold as we're going through here now. Just as perfect as perfect can be. I didn't know this the other day. Why didn't he make her like that in the beginning like the rest of his females? Because it would be unbecoming to him. He's the fountain of all purity. That's the reason he had to let Satan get a hold of her. What he done in the perversion. Such a creature would be would not be uh, becoming to him, originally designed for. All his works that he designed in the original is in continuity. All of his original works is in continuity. The female dog, the male dog. See, female cow, the male cow. Everything in continuity. All nature is in continuity. Seed die, go in the ground. It's like death, burial, resurrection. The sap goes down out of a tree, drops its leaf, comes back the next year with the resurrection of a new leaf. See what I mean? Yeah. Everything, even nature of God, is all in a continuity in one. And here's one designed out of the continuity of God. Yeah. Nature's so designed so it can't sin. Think. Right. Right. The original creation of God could not sin. Amen. Oh, no, 
Don't you see now in this view here, the perversion of the church? The original is God's Word. There's no sin in God. See what I mean? Here's a creature that come into existence by perversion. God's going to have a church, but look at this perverted thing they got out here. God has male and female, but this woman, see the very symptoms of it shows back what was in God's mind. We could take an hour or two and break that down. She made this creature for that way. He made the creature and turned so Satan could get a hold of her, and he did. He still got her. She better flee to the cross, like man too. Notice, all nature runs in continuity. If he had made the woman in the same original creation, there'd have been no sin. Because she couldn't have done it. Amen. Amen. She couldn't have done it. Right. She is the perversion of the original creation. So is all sin a perversion of the original truth. What is a lie? Is the truth perverted? What is an adultery? Is the right act perverted? So there is the perverted creature. There is the perverted whole thing. And the whole thing is spelled S-I-N. Laying right there. That's why the question's so great. Only a piece scrap made of a man to deceive him by. God made it right here. He's proved it. That's what she's made for. An immoral woman is the lowest thing that can be thought of in the earth. Excuse this, young ladies. She's nothing but a human garbage can. A sex exposure. That's all she is, an immoral woman. Is a human sexual garbage can of pollution. We're filthy, dirty, ornery, low down, filth is disposed by her. What she made this way for? For deception. Every sin that ever was on the earth was caused by a woman. And a, I handle this just from Chicago. A, a woman wrote this article, the police force, that they chased down in United States, metropolitan United States, that 98% of every crime that was ever did in any form in the United States, there was either a woman in it or behind it. Now, I'm saying all this to get to one thing here at the end so that you can see what's the matter. She was made to deceive like she did Adam at the beginning, telling him that the fruit was pleasant and so forth, to deceive him and take him away from the Word. That's the way the church does today. Same thing. But then, after that, he become her ruler, to rule over. Now, what a difference in this day, in this day of conception. Instead of him being her ruler, she has become his God. That's right. Sure. She rules him. Now you can probably well understand what I've been hitting at. By her beauty and her sex control, her shape, what was given to her by Satan, the byproduct that Satan did, she is sent to deceive sons of God and she can sway more of them to hell than any other instrument Satan's got. Right. Exactly right. I'm talking to the immoral now, not you sisters. We'll give you your place, right place in a few minutes in the Word of God here. It was in God's plan from the beginning. Now, to do this today, what is the God of the United States? You remember the tabernacle years ago I preached on that? The God of this modern day, a little flapper sitting there with makeup on and dress pulled up over her knees and things like that. I said, behold your God. And that's right. She's on every advertisement, half naked. She's on the street the same way. It's an instrument of Satan. Amen. From the beginning, Jesus said. See? We see with the soul now and from the beginning and what he's talking about. Now, the heathens used to make her a god. Did you know that? A goddess? Sure it is. They make her a goddess. 
For they did have sex acts in their worship. They claimed that she was a creator in her womb. She carried the seed and created. That's a lie. Amen. There's only one creator. That's God. Amen. But you remember Paul there, Diana of Ephesus? An image of a rock said the goddess of heaven throw down us to see how heathen worship is. And we, not knowing it, turns right straight back to heathen worship again to women, the very lowest creature on the earth. Amen. Woman worship. She'll sway man any way she wants to. And not knowing all that beauty on the outside, it hell's on the inside. Solomon said her, her gates is a gates to hell. Now, we see plainly here what Jesus spoke of in the Revelations, the second chapter and the 15th verse of the Nicolaitan doctrine. The oncoming of that church pulling itself away from the Word. Also, we can see here plainly these vulgar, ungodly, filthy programs that we have on television of Hollywood sex queens. Amen. We can see the filth of this city as these kids, little old girls walking up and down the street here with little bit of tight toes twisted around and it cold enough to freeze them to death. Amen. They don't know that that's the devil doing that. Amen. They are possessed of an evil spirit and don't know it. Amen. You don't see a female dog doing that, do you? Amen. You don't see any other female doing that. And no male better walk up to her either. Amen. See? Now, you get the picture? We'll introduce something just in a moment, the Lord willing. Now, you see the Nicolaitans, you see their doctrine, you see the teenage queens, they call them. These strip teases out on the street you used to have to go to a, some vulgar show on the side to see a strip tease. Just open your eyes, look out on the street. That's all you have to do now. The whole thing's a strip tease. Yeah. Sure what are they doing for? To tantalize, tempt. That's the only thing she can do it for. Amen. She does it because she's filthy. She does it because she's made that way. She don't realize that she's an instrument in the hands of Satan. But that's what she is. Even in our schools today, they're teaching sex acts. Our rotten world of woman worship. I know they don't want to believe that stand and sing some kind of hymn and so forth on one day and out with women running around all night long. See? All right. Praise the Lord. When in God's sight, the Word, she is the lowest of all animals that God put on the earth. Watch. That's why God forbids her to teach His Word. Right. 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 That's right. That's right. First Timothy. 2, 9 to 15, I suffer not a woman to teach her to have any. And also, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silent in the churches, first not permitted to them to speak. Amen. For they are commanded to be inside, all so saith the law. But today, what does the church do? They make her pastors evangelists. Amen. When the Bible completely forbids it. And the Bible said, as also saith the law, making it run in continuity. Amen. The whole Amen. thing is like the Lamb was last night, the only place of worship. Or the shed blood of the Lamb, it's the only place today in Christ. only way to do is come into Him, that's the only place to worship. It always was that way. The only place to worship is under the shed blood. So now, we see the whole picture of it unfolding to us. There she is. That's why God won't let her teach. Won't let her do anything in the church but to sit still with a veiled face. Now, can you see why I have said the things and done the things that I have done? Amen. Knowing all this in my heart, brother, sisters, I know sisters. I'm, you got your place just a moment and a wonderful character that God can mold in you. But I'm just trying to speak on the other side to show what you're actually from the beginning. Jesus told us to go back to the beginning to find it. That's what we're doing. Now, I've had to hit the high points on a lot of this, and I hope you understand it. And you people who will be listening to this tape, I hope you understand. Just go back. 
It's only to show that Jesus said, go back from the beginning and find out. All things go back to the beginning. You can see today why people they say, I'm a woman hater. That's far from the truth. I do not. They call a woman hater. Remember, they call Paul a woman hater. A woman minister not long ago said, oh, you're like old Paul. All he had to do is pick on us women. A saint of God that was permitted to write the Bible, the New Testament. And dispute his words, he said, if an angel from heaven teaches any other thing in this, and I've said, let him be accursed. Yeah. Let alone some woman preacher. They said Elijah was a woman hater. He wasn't a woman hater of real women. He just didn't like them Jezebels. Yeah. And if that be so, then must be God must be the same way because He is the Word which come to the prophets. Yeah. <laughs> so it must be God the same way. So see, He knows original creation from the beginning, He said. Yeah. From the beginning. They were prophets who the word came to. And he made her for man and not man for her. Did you know that? That woman was made for man and not man for woman. How many knows that? The Bible teaches that. All right. She was given a place in man before the fall equal over all creation. But after the fall. Now. Here we bring the subject up. But after the fall, he was her ruler. She must keep silent in all matters. Now, after the original beginning is over, Jesus said it wasn't so from the beginning. That's when time began. When God made it first in his original creation. All to understand, say amen again. Amen. In the beginning, God created just one male and one female. But then the woman was made different from the animals, all other animals, for deception. Now watch. Now it wasn't so from the beginning. She was made, if she'd stayed in original condition, she would have never been no fall. But she caused the fall and the interruption that broke the whole continuity of God and throw death, sorrow, and everything else on the earth. She had made thus. Now notice. Now after... The beginning. After the beginning. After time began. Back in that was eternity. Is over. Notice after that fall was made by Eve. After the fall, there was need to be another covenant made. Now this is going to stumble you. But I'm going to give you the scripture to prove that this is the truth. Now... Notice, after the fall, Jesus said, God at the beginning made one of a kind. But now, after the fall, now we're going beyond that. The covenant was co equal. But now, after the fall, there's another covenant made. Now, she was no longer ruler with him. Each must have a separate covenant. Now, let's see if that's right. Let's take Genesis 3 and find out if this is right. Now, as we go along, because we want to be positive that these things, they're taught out, brought out, exactly true, so that maybe right here we have a little time, because we're not too far from the end now, to get to the closing part of the subject, to show why and what about divorces and so forth. Now, in Genesis, the third chapter, and we will begin... Uh, now, with the third and the sixteenth verse. Let's begin at the fourteenth verse. And the Lord said unto the serpent, I was going to curse it, because thou hast, thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and the woman's seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, the promising, coming through the woman, the Messiah, to redeem. Unto the woman, he said. Now look, now there's the covenant with the serpent, which were all, all right before him, at the beginning. Or before the beginning. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrows. And thy conception, 
And in sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Not no more co-equal together at all. Now she's turned right around. She's the ruler. And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat it. Cursed be the ground. Now, cursed Adam now. Cursed be the ground. For thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life, thorns and thistles, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field, and in sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou returns to the ground, for out of it out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Two covenants. Now, that closes the beginning of what Jesus said. It wasn't so at the beginning. We got another covenant now. Notice. It's another covenant. Now, there's a covenant for the product and a, the byproduct. Notice, the fall brought trouble, death to every creature of the creation, making a difference in all nature. Now, let us notice what Jesus said about from the beginning. It wasn't so. Now, it is not so from it is now, it is after the beginning. Now there's a double covenant. First it was just a covenant. Adam and Eve was co equal. One man, one woman. Now the woman sinned. And what did she do? That told them all to death, and God had to make a covenant by that, another covenant. Here it is, right here in Genesis three sixteen. He made another covenant. Now, the world is to be repopulated not by the original creation of God like in the beginning, not by the original creation, but by sex desire. Ah, that takes care of the beginning, doesn't it? In the beginning, there's only one man and one woman, one male, one female. But when she crossed that line and brought this sin, now the world's to be repopulated again by sex. Yes. Not by creation. Amen. By sex. See where the woman's at now? Now, but that's the way the world's populated today through women. That's the reason Jesus had to come through the woman. To bring it back to its original beginning again. Without sex desire. He's virgin born. But hallelujah. There will come a time. Where it won't be no more sex. But God shall call his children from the dust of the earth. Back like it was in the original. Not to any woman. But through the molding of the clay and the cosmic lights and the petroleum, He'll create again like He did Adam at the first time. Hallelujah. Jesus made this possible by God making Himself a man and coming to the world so He could die through the, this woman. Now is testing time by sin. Now, you see, then after the beginning, it was something else was introduced. Now, this is going to shock you. Are you tired? No. Just sit still just a little longer. Then when the double covenant was made by man and woman through sex, another covenant altogether, not the original covenant, but another covenant. Now what's introduced? Polygamy. And all. Then after the beginning, polygamy was introduced. Both in man and in beast. After the beginning. The fall. God now secondarily sets a new nature again by sex. God created the first without sex. Do you believe that? Amen. Now it's another covenant with nature. He sets it in another order by sex. 
Second covenant. One male, many females. One buck, deer, a whole harem of does. Is that right? Yes. One bull, a whole herd of cattle, cows. One rooster, a yard full of hens. Is that right? Yes. One David after his own heart with 500 wives. With a hundred children born to him in one year of different women. A man after God's own heart. One Solomon with a thousand wives. But notice now, it wasn't so at the beginning. But now, it's actually the beginning. The woman's done this. Then she just becomes what she is now. See? David. The king which represented Christ. Hold that in your mind. David represented Christ. You believe that? Amen. Christ is sitting, going to sit on his throne. And this David, a man after God's own heart, had 500 wives. See what I mean? David with his 500 wives. Solomon with his thousand. And Solomon is the son of David in the natural, which represents Jesus Christ, the son of David in the spiritual. But that's natural sex life. This is going to be spiritual created. Why? Created. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was at the beginning. But not now in this life we live in now. Notice. Don't fail this now. Take it all down to your hearts. But... Not one of those women could even have one more husband. Amen. Amen. He's original creation, not her. Amen. Not one of those women could have one more husband. But that one husband could have a thousand wives. Amen. That's thus saith the Lord. Amen. That's the Bible. Now, I have went back, took my time, and showed you back under what started what Jesus said. Now, do you see it clearly? Yes. They could have as many. Oh, you say that was just for Israel, is it? When Abraham took Sarah down into the Philistine country, there was a king down there named Amalek. And Sarah was a hundred years old right at it, but she had been changed back to a young woman and been made beautiful. You know that? Yes. All right. And Amalek... Wanted her for a wife. You remember my message on it? Amalek wanted to take Sarah for a wife. Probably had a harem. But he could not take her if she was married to Abraham. So Abraham said to Sarah, Say that you are my brother because he'll kill me so that he can have you. Why don't you just chase Abraham out of the country and take his wife and move on? Not only a law was it with believers, but to all people in the creation. Amen. Sinner or saints, you're responsible, man, for these acts. There was a heathen king. How many knows that story is true? Amen. It's a Bible. Genesis, about 16th chapter, I think. You notice, Emily would have took her for a wife. He fixed himself to have this new Hebrew girl. And he said, this is my, she said, that's my brother. He said, that's my sister. And Amalek said, I'll just take her for a wife then. Could you imagine a man doing a thing like that? But he did it. And then that night, while he went to sleep, the Lord appeared to me in a dream and said, Amalek, you're as good as a dead man. He's protecting that, that stream of Jewish blood there, you see. He said, you're as good as a dead man. You've got another man's wife you're fixing to marry. He said, Lord... You know the integrity of my heart. Said, did not she tell me that was her brother? Did not he himself say, that's my sister? He said, I know the integrity of your heart. That is the reason I wouldn't permit you to sin against me. Amen. Is that right? Yes. Said, restore his wife. Because that man is my prophet. Amen. And unless you take him back his wife and let him pray for you, not your priest. If he don't pray for you, your whole nation's gone. Amen. Amen. There's amazing grace. Right? Your whole nation's gone. That's that man's wife, and he's my prophet. 
Amen. That's thus saith the Lord. That's a scripture. Now we find out. Death was caused. Death is the cause of sin of the woman come through the woman and not the man. By her way of living her life and by her all death comes. Her way of giving life is death. How many knows that? Job 14, if you want to put down the scripture. I got, if you question this, i got scriptures wrote down for every bit of this. If you want to read Job 14 there, it says, Man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Is that right? He cometh up like the flower, he's cut down and wasted away and so forth. See? Uh, every man that's born of a woman is born in death as soon as he comes. But when he's born into the creation of God, he cannot die. He's from that other tree that was in the Garden of Eden. Christ. Eternal life come by the tree. Or you say she was a tree? Sure. Well, he said, thou shalt not take of this tree. God said in Genesis back there, thou shalt not take of this tree. Well, the woman is the tree. She's the fruit tree. You're the fruit of your mother. The fruit of the womb. And you. That's right. And then the fruit of the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden is Christ. Through the woman come death. Through the man in the original creation come life. To be born of a woman is death. Be born of Christ is life. Get the idea? That's where now you see where the goddesses went to, don't you? First, Adam and Eve. Type the second Adam and Eve. See the multiplication. Now the multiplication of Adam and Eve was through sex to replenish the earth, but it wasn't so at the beginning. God just made a male and a female like He did His other creatures. See? Legal. Just like the church. Now, let us, in view of these vindicated truths of God, search a little further, if you want to. All right? Now, this may hurt just a little bit till we get down to the bottom of it. But I'm just going to show you the truth of it. There is no minister that can marry a widow. Did you know that? You want to read that? All right, you get Leviticus, Leviticus 21, 7 and Ezekiel 44, 22. And it'll show you that the priesthood was not to marry a woman that's been touched by man. This type is of the virgin bride of Jesus Christ because they handled the fire of God, the priest did, Aaron's sons. We haven't got time to read it all and get out by noon. We've got 20 minutes yet. And them Aaron's sons that handled the, the, the fire of God. So they could not marry a woman that had been touched by another man. Amen. The unchanging God said so. They could not marry another woman that a woman been touched by a man. Showing in type here, if you want to see it, that the church of the living God is purely unadulterated the Word of God and not a denomination has been handled by man. Amen. No. Let's read this here. I want to get this to you. Matthew 5. Jesus spoke here of something really of a vital importance. We want to see it. Matthew 5. I wrote on my... I marked out some of the things I was going to say just to the man, so I had quite a little time saying it just before our sisters. But I want to uh, go out here now before now, sister. I want to put you into the place for the, what God's Word promised you. And you see them. You stay in that place too. Matthew five thirty-two. I want you to notice here to support this same idea of one and many. Matthew 30. Uh, I think it's Matthew five thirty-two. 31 to begin with. It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. As Jesus speaking, one said from the beginning. Now watch. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving the cause of fornications, causes her to commit adultery. See? Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. Why, she marry again. And whosoever marrieth her and is divorced, committed adultery. See, she's got a living husband, so no man can marry her. 
care what she does and who she is. She's got a living husband. There's no grounds for her at all. But it's not for him because it's her, not him. Get it? You have to make the word run in continuity. See? Nothing saying he couldn't, but she can't. See? Cause is her, not him. That's exactly what the Bible says. Cause is her. It is not stated against him to remarry, but her. Why? Christ in the type. Notice, it is stated that he cannot remarry. Only a virgin. He can remarry. He can, he can remarry again if it's a virgin. But he can't marry somebody else's wife. No, indeed. He. And if he does marry a divorced woman, he is living in adultery. I don't care who he is. The Bible said, Whosoever marrieth her that is put away liveth in adultery. There you are. Not no divorces. See that original back there from the beginning now? Remarrying? Now notice, he can, but she can't. Like David... Like Solomon, like the continuity of the whole Bible. Now, same as David and the rest of them. Now you notice in 1 Corinthians 17, notice Paul commands the wife that is that divorces her husband to remain single or be reconciled. Not to remarry. She must remain single or to be uh Reconcile back to her husband. She cannot remarry. She must remain single. But notice he never said about the man. See, you can't make the word lie. From the beginning, the sex law by polygamy. Now the word of God runs true with nature. Of God runs into continuity. See how there is one school went east and the other went west on it? You've got to come back to the truth to find out what it is. It's always been that way. That's a regular covenant with God from the beginning. First, before the beginning, from the beginning, there's just one and one. After the sin came in, then there was one man and a bunch of women. Run that way in nature, ever animal. And human beings and natural flesh is animal. We're a mammal. We know that, all of us. See? And it's all God's nature and continuity. But now that the seals are open, the Spirit of truth directs us to the Word. That explains why all the mistakes has been down through the ages because the seals was not open. This was not revealed. It's true. Notice, you, you can't make the shadows fail as I preached to you last night about the shadow across the floor. It's got to come out right. Amen. How could there be a shadow of an elephant coming across the floor and a little bitty spindly man come out to be the elephant? Amen. Or the elephant the little spindly man? Now, if you'll notice it in perfect time. Now, there is a true woman. A true woman virgin that marries her husband and lives and she's a blessed thing to the man. If God could have given His Son any better thing than a wife, He would have given that to Him. Amen. But she's designed to be a sex act. And no other animal is designed like that. No other creature on the earth is designed like that. That's the reason. You see polygamy. Because of that. That's what brought it in. Now look, in the final analysis, look. There is one Jesus Christ. Is that right? One man, God Emmanuel. You believe that? Amen. But the members of his wife are many. Amen. Thousands times thousands of thousands. Is that right? Yes. His wife, the bride, the church. You understand now? That's why he said to Adam, before sex was ever induced or introduced, multiply to replenish the earth. When he was yet in the beginning, when he was yet both male and female in himself, there shows then that the bride's got to come from the Word. Amen. By spiritual multiplication. Multiplications. See? 
replenishing the earth. Now, in the sex acts, see, the school's got those two things mixed up. Therefore, you can't do it. You've got to bring it back to the truth of it. In the beginning. And at the end, there will be one Lord Jesus and his bride, Manny. Sing it. <laughs> you get it? There was one David on one throne, one king, after God's own heart, with 500 wives. Jesus sitting on his throne. Hallelujah. In the millennium, with a wife like it was at the beginning, created out of the earth by the hand of Almighty God in the resurrection. Of many members. There you are. Women struggle to be that. Come into Christ, then you'll not be in that filthy mess out there. But as long as you're just a church member trying to live moral and good yourself, you'll never make it. Neither can a man make it outside of Christ. Amen. As Paul went on to say, But there in Christ there is neither male nor female. They're all one. But to get this marriage and divorce straightened out, so that you would know which was right and which was wrong. Now, he plainly shows here in these times, there is one Christ and many members of that wife. Notice, he can put us away for spiritual fornications and false doctrine anytime he wants to. But how dare you try to put him away and make it? Yes. A man can put away his wife and marry another, but not the woman put away her husband and marry another. See all the shadows and types there? Perfectly balanced up. See? The original creation, not the byproduct, nowhere, not the church, the bride to the word, not the woman, the man. Each time, that's which never says anything against the man doing it. It's always the woman. Exactly. But she can be the bride of Christ by being. And remember, she being a part of a man, the Bible said she can own. Nevertheless, I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp any authority, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then even Adam was not deceived, but the byproduct was deceived. Now, notwithstanding, she shall be saved if she continues in holiness and sobriety and in childbearing. And all such. Because then she becomes a part of this man. That's what brings... Why didn't Abraham... Why didn't God kill Sarah sitting right there? Denying a lying right in the face of God. Sitting there as a mortal man eating flesh. Eating bread. Drinking milk. And he said, why did Sarah laugh back there in the back behind him in the tent and never see her? Saying, these, how can these things be? She said, I never said it. Oh, oh my... Tell God he's a liar to his face. But he couldn't take her. Why? She's a part of Abraham. (laughs) He couldn't hurt her without hurting Abraham. Now you women see where you belong. And the Bible said you women be like Sarah was, which adorned herself in modest apparel. Live honest and true to her own husband, loving him so much that he, she called him her Lord, ruler. Amen. Ownership. And you, some of the women put on these nasty clothes, eat out here to throw yourself before men. Jesus said, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. <clears throat> then who's guilty, the man or you? Amen. He's a male. Made so he could take this act. See, and you're the female that ought to refuse. Amen. And why do you put yourself out like that? It ain't for comfort. You know it can't be when you're half froze to death with them shorts on. Amen. Hmm? Can't be for comfort. And what is it? It's for filth. Amen. You won't admit it, but it's the Bible says so. Amen. It's the truth. It's a filthy spirit that's in you. You don't want to be filthy, but you don't realize spiritually you are filthy. Because you're presenting yourself filthy. Now a man, his old dirty, naughty knees, and if he had on hardly any clothes, all would make any difference. His body's not tempting. 
Why? He was in the original creation. Character should be. <laughs> but you're the byproduct to tempt by. God have mercy on my this sinful world. I'll be glad when it's over. Amen. Notice. <laughs> he can put away his wife anytime he wants to. But she can't put him away. Amen. He can make me, he can throw me in the dust anytime he takes an ocean to you. But oh brother, I better try to throw him there. <laughs> I'm finished. Amen. Solomon can marry any woman that wasn't married. He could marry any woman he wanted to. A priest could marry only a woman that was a virgin. Solomon, like David, he married, uh, what was her name? Abigail, which is a man called a fool. He had a nice wife. And he died. And Abigail was married to David. He was a king, not a priest. See? So he, he married, but a priest could not do that because he had touched a, got a woman to be his wife that was already been some man's wife. So that shows the virgency of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bridal had to be unadulterated, the word. Not one word missing, no word. Certainly. Could you imagine a correct bride, one breast off and the other, and, uh, something other wrong, you know? That's not going to be the bride of Christ. She's perfect. Amen. She's everything, the word. Not one word failing anywhere. No. Notice. He can put her away, but she cannot put him away. He did it and proved it in the days when Luther, Wesley, and Pentecost, when they refused to become the further part of him Amen. by having spiritual, sexual affair to become pregnated with further part of the Word. Amen. You understand? Amen. She refused, the Luther church refused for Christ to have any more desire with her. Luther refused it. Let me say this. Go to call me something anyhow. So is it today with every one of them. Amen. They fail to take that word. They refuse Christ. Amen. And any woman that refuses a man, his child, has no right to be a wife to him. Amen. 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 You remember in the Bible when the king married Esther? Because the queen refused. He just got him another one. Amen. And when the, what happened? When she refused to come out with the king, to obey him. The same thing it is with a woman that refuses to be wife to her husband. And so is it with the church that refuses to become pregnant in the age that we now live in to bring forth children of this age. We are not Luther's, we're not Wesley's, neither are we Pentecostals. We've got to be the children of this age to the pregnancy of the Word of God to bring forth a child of this age. The seed child. Amen. I hope you understand. Couldn't be pregnant, no. So what did he do? Put her away in divorcement. That's right. But she dares put him away. He put her away. He went right on revealing his word to the body and vindicating him, saying by himself his children begin to look more like him because it's fully maturing. Or they become children of the word. Not children of the church, children of the word. And the bride will be a lovely little lady of the word. Unadulterated, not touched by any man's organization. Any man-made theory should be purely unadulterated bride of the Word. Amen. 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 I hope you get that out on the air. She'll be the pregnated daughter of God. See what a great honor a woman can be? See what a great thing the church can be? But you see where filth has got her to? Then trying to compare that church out there with the church here. You can't do it trying to compare the street harlot with the church of the living God or the woman, the correct woman with the harlot. Why is there such things as that? It's a law of God. The law of contrast. How will we know how to enjoy the daylight if there wasn't a night? How will we know how to enjoy the dry weather if there wasn't rain? How will we know to enjoy and respect a real woman if there wasn't a dirty one?
He went right on revealing it, revealing his word. But dare any one of us to try to put away him and marry another. Now, surely it's plain why both theories are wrong. You can't make it run this way. It's gone. You make it run that run plumb past the promise. Here's the promise. Here's the thing right here. The word is not contradictory. It has to stay in continuity. Amen. Now, no more than Matthew twenty eight nineteen contradicts Acts two thirty eight. Now, some of you women, some of you men, I, I know you're you're disagreeing with it because you know you can't hide that right now. <laughs> you can't. But let me just show you something. If Matthew twenty eight nineteen said, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, and they turned around and every person who was ever baptized was baptized contrary to that. Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the for even all through the Bible age and for three hundred years after the Bible age, to the Nicaea Council. Then they adopted dogmas instead. What's the difference? If it isn't revealed, and do you know the whole book, the whole Bible is a revelation? That's how you have to know the truth between this and, and the other. It's because it's a revelation, and the revelation must be exactly with the Word. Amen. Not contrary to the Word. You say, well, I was revealed to me. Then if it's contrary to the Word, it never come from God. Amen. That's right. Now, if you want to take Max, Matthew sixteen eighteen, Jesus said Himself that the entire church, His church would be built upon spiritual revelation of Himself, which is the Word. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and flesh and blood never revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you, and upon this rock. Now, I know our Catholic friends there. You say it was built upon Peter, and Peter the apostolic so-and-so so so apostolic conce- uh, succession. The Protestants said it was built upon Jesus Christ. Not to be different, but take just what he said. He said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you, and upon this rock. Amen. Amen. Spiritual revelation of what the Word is. I'll build my church and the gates of hell will never shake it down. Amen. His wife will not be tempted with other men. I'll build my church and the gates of hell can never shake it. And Abel and Cain in the Garden of Eden. Cain drawed his own conception. He said, now look, God's a good God. He's all over all nature. So I'll get the beans and potatoes and I'll get the, the flowers and I'll make him a real pretty altar. That's a church. He knelt down, he believed God, he worshipped God, put up his hands and offered this sacrifice. He done everything religious that Abel did. Abel built the same kind of an altar. But when Abel brought his, he brought a lamb. Now Cain thought that making an antidote for sin, that his father and mother must to eat fruit, as they were taught in that garden. But Abel, by divine revelation, noted it was the blood that did it. By divine revelation. And the Bible said in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 11th chapter, that Abel, by faith, revelation, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than came by which God testified that he was righteous. Is that right? Amen. Amen. Brothers, sisters, this is plain as anything can be. I mean, there's the whole thing. Now, on the marriage and divorce, it has to be revealed. Until it's revealed, you don't know it. But he promised in this last days, in this age, that every hidden mystery in the Bible would be revealed. How many knows that? Revelations, the 10th chapter. Jesus promised it, that all of these hidden mysteries on, on marriage and divorce, all these other hidden mysteries that's been, would be revealed in the end time. Now, you remember the voice said, go to Tucson? Remember the mystic light in the skies, the seven angels standing there? Come back in the opening of the seven seals. Watch what's taking place. That is true. Now, just a little bit farther. But now, hear ye. I know you're just getting time for you to go eat, but I'm just eating fine. Amen. <laughs> Notice. Now the woman's got her place. And she is a jewel. Solomon, this man had had 10,000 wives. 
or had a thousand wives, rather. He said that a man that's found a wife has found a good thing. He said a good woman is a jewel in his crown. That's an honor. But an unrighteous one is water in his blood. That's his life. He said there might be a one righteous man found in a thousand. Solomon said this. But said you wouldn't find one righteous woman in a thousand. Solomon said that. Now, notice that. That how it is. But you see, woman, you are you are a jewel. If you want to be a jewel. But the desire has to be by you. And you see why the marriage and divorce was that Jesus pointed back on her. It was because your kind was the cause of all sin. That's the reason polygamy and divorce and things was introduced. At the beginning, it never was so, and it won't be so in the world over yonder. Look at Jacob, out of whom come the patriarchs. He had at least a dozen wives. He married two sisters and had concubine wives besides that. Common-law women that he lived with. And those patriarchs was born right out of those concubine women. Is that right? See, you have to make the word run smooth. Oh, I got pages on them. If a clergyman ever questions me on it, and we get together, we can talk it. But surely if he's got any spirituality at all, he can see right here, it's the truth. There's no question to it. A good woman is a good thing. I know that. I know it by real women. I've met real women that's genuine, just as real as any man that ever walked. She's a byproduct and a piece of him. And in the fall, he listened to her and he just, she's part of him. But it's up to her. She's made so she can be filthy. And she's given the right to refuse or to accept. That's contrary to the original nature at the beginning. See? But there you are. Now, it's 12 o'clock. So I'll just omit something here for a few minutes. I want to ask you something. Now remember... I say this to just my group only, and out in the air. I'm saying this to only my own followers. This message is only to them. And what I'm going to say here, any minister, he, that's his she- he's a shepherd of the flock. Let him do whatever he wants to. That's up to him and God. Any priest, any preacher, that's up to you, my brother. I'm only speaking here in Jeffersonville. The only place I'd speak this at is because it's my own flock. It's a flock that the Holy Ghost give me to understand to be overseer over and he'll hold me responsible for it. These people of mine have been converts here from across the land that I've led to Christ. And little children, I'm here to help you and I am your friend. You might think I'd speak against you. I'm saying this to you for your good. Yeah. I love you. And if that isn't so, God's my judge. You know I love you. This is an awful strong thing. I didn't know how to bring it out. What did I do when I got men and women sitting in my congregation? Some has been married twice or three times. Good men, good women, all mixed up. What done it? False teaching. Amen. Exactly. Not waiting on the Lord. What God has joined together, let no man put us. And not what man joined together, what God joined together. Amen. When you got a direct revelation from God, that's your wife and the same thing. That's yours the rest of your life. Hey, but what man joins together, anybody can put apart. But what God joins together, no man better dare to touch it. Amen. Whatsoever God joins together, said, let no man put asunder. Not what some half-drunk magistrate or something else put together. Amen. Or some backslidden preacher. Amen. With a bunch of creeds and a book that let him do anything in the world. The Word of God laying right there. Amen. Hey, Amen. I'm talking about what God joined together. Amen. Now... I'm going to say this to you. I'm very careful what I say to you. I don't mean to be rough with you people. I don't mean to be rough with you, my pastor brothers. I don't mean that. But I'm responsible, realizing that this has been given into my hands, and if I can't hold it, I don't know how to give it out. 
And I know that this table, oh my, I just get ready to the office, open up, oh, here it comes. See? Just like it was on the serpent seed, but it's absolutely proven to be right. I got papers right here out of paper of women right now. And even in, in the great, some of the great dioceses has got the pictures of the original a snake crawling a woman's leg just, and how it goes around her. She has all kinds of sensations and things, something that a man can never touch her with, with this huge snake wrapping around her and so forth. That's exactly the truth. And it's going worse and worse and will get worse. Serpent. Which he was not, he could not have had the sex affair with her when he was a serpent. But remember, I was having a debate the other day with a, a not a debate, just a assembly of God minister and associate. Said, you're wrong on that. I said, well, I may be. I'd like for you to tell me. He said, then he went ahead and began to talk about it. First thing you know, he got himself lost. And one thing he said, he said, Brother Branham, where is that species? God said, one of his kind. Now, where is that species you said was between man and beast that science can't find now? Where is he at? Said, is he on the earth? Was he a Japanese? No, because a Japanese's blood won't mix with a woman. No other animal will mix with her. No. It won't, neither will a man spurn uh, mixed with a, with a female. It won't do it. Then where is that certain animal? Now, God said, let everything bring forth of its kind. I waited just a minute, and the sweetness of the Holy Spirit said, tell him it's here. Now, at first I said, well, it may become distinct. He said, but Brother Branham, that we're talking about the Word, aren't we? I said, yes, sir. And I said, of course, claim that the other things like dinosaurs and, and mammoths and so forth, mammals, uh, mammoths rather, they're uh, distinct and so forth. I said, it could have been that. He said, Brother Branham, we're talking about proof of the word. If sin, sure, then the original sinner ought to be here also. Amen. And I said, Lord Jesus, you said, take no thought what you shall say when you come before man because it'll be given to you in that hour. Lord, what shall I say? He said, tell him it's here. <laughs> Just the same as see the visions on the platform. I said, it's here, not knowing where. He said, where? And before I could even think, he said, it's a serpent. It's exactly what it was. For he's no longer a beast. He was cursed and put on his belly for the rest of his days. He's here. Is that right? And still in that act that he done, still the same sin works around a woman like a male sect like that. That's where she has her wall-eyed conditions and things when she has her sensations. Far beyond what any man could ever do. I'll stop there because we're in a mixed crowd. I get the man. I'll, we'll talk more about it. i got all the papers and things laying right here, right at my hand right now. I was going to bring to you this morning. I was going to take the full day in this. But I'll close now in saying this. This is to my church only. The, not my church. The little flock that believes me and follows me. This is to them. The other day, knowing that when I tell you anything, it must come, thus saith the Lord. Then I had the Scriptures as He revealed it to me. But Lord God, what can I say to that congregation? I'll have separations. Man will be steady on the porch and out in the yard and everywhere else. Shall I leave her? Women, shall I leave my husband? What shall I do? I said, Lord, what can I do? Something said to me, go up yonder in the mountain. I'll talk to you. And while I was up in the mountain, not knowing... That down in Tucson, they were seeing it. But even the teachers called the children from my little girl and them from the schoolroom and said, Look yonder in that mountain. There's a fiery looking amber cloud going up in the air and coming back down, going up in the air and coming back down. (laughs) Miss Evans, are you here? Ronnie, you here? I come on back down to the station, this young boy, by the filling station, the Evans filling station there. And before I knew what the boy was going to say, he tucked me on my feet. He said, Brother Branham, you was up in that mountain over yonder, wasn't you? I said, what do you mean, Ronnie? No. See, to see what he was going to do. A lot of times things happen. I don't, you don't say it to people. It becomes, the thing of it is, you see so much happen, it becomes common to you. See? I just don't tell the people. I said, Ronnie, what was you? He said, I can show you right where you were at. I said, I'll call Mama. And we stood here and watched that cloud hanging up in the going up and down. I said, it's got to be Brother Brandon sitting up in there somewhere. That's God talking to him. 
And the whole city people looked at it. On a bright day with no clouds, no word over this big amber cloud hanging there, coming down like a funnel and going back and spreading out. Friends, and then I'm closing. You can go from this. That's when this was being revealed to me, what I'm going to tell you right now. So don't miss it. Now I'm speaking to our followers only who's following me and this message. Only, not the outside. Bear me record of this before God. Just to this group only. Now we are found in this mess because of misinterpreted theology. Is that right? That's why you women married the second time and you men because misinterpreted theology. Now I want to show you something that he told me. And if God, our Creator, was questioned the question when he was here on earth, Jesus Christ, and when his delivering prophet came forth, Moses, down in Egypt, to bring the children out of of Egypt, to put them in the promised land, And Jesus said here that Moses seen the people in this condition and he granted them a writing of divorcement because the situation was what it was. Moses found such as let him suffer. God permitted Moses, that prophet sent to the people, to grant this writing of divorcement to him. And in 1 Corinthians, the, the seventh chapter, the twelfth and fifteenth verse in the New Testament prophet, Paul, who met the same thing in the church and spoke this, this is I, not the Lord. Is that right? Because of the divorce conditions. It wasn't so from the beginning. But Moses was permitted it and God recognized it righteousness. And Paul also had the right when he found his church in that condition. Now, you believe this to be true. And believe it to come from God. And by the vindication of his cloud and his message has brought me this far. Should not God up on the mountain permit me to do the same thing, to suffer yet, to go on the way you are and do it no more? Go with your wives and live in peace. For the hour is late. The coming of the Lord is at hand. We haven't got time to break these things up. Don't you dare try to do it again. I'm speaking only to my congregation. But if you are married, and God bore me witness of that on the mountain, that I could say this. A supernatural revelation because of the opening of the seven seals. And this is a question in God's Word. Let them go on as they are and sin no more. It wasn't so from the beginning. That is right. It wasn't so, and it will not be at the end. But under modern conditions, as God's servant, I won't call myself his prophet, but I believe maybe if I wouldn't be sent for that, I'm laying a ground for him when he does come. So under the modern conditions, I command you to go to your home with your wife now. If you are happy with her, live with her. Raise your children in the admonition of God. But God be merciful to you if you ever do that again. You teach your children to never do a thing like that. Bring them up in the admonition of God. And now that you are as you are, let us go now at the late evening hour that we're living in and press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ for all things will be possible. Until I see you tonight, the Lord God bless you while we pray. Lord God, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Thou art the same great Jehovah that suffered Moses. Moses, that servant, what would he tell his people? And God, you suffered him 
to give a writing of divorcement. Paul, the great apostle, who was a writer of the New Testament as Moses was of the Old. Moses wrote the laws and a dispensation of laws. Many of the prophets, their words was injected into it. But Moses wrote the laws. And you suffered him a writing, to write them a writing of divorcement because of the hardness of their heart. The great Saint Paul, being the writer of the New Testament, could also make such an assertion that I speak under these conditions. I am not the Lord. So is it today, Lord God, at the end of the world, as we're here under the mercy of God, knowing it soon we're to answer in His presence. And that you have did so much, Lord, I'm sure in the sight of these people, they'll hang on to this like it come from you. And to bear record here today of many people sitting here that even saw that sign up in the mountain where the angels of the Lord came in the whirlwind, where it came in the seven angels, where the revealing of the seven mysteries was unfolded. And that same angel in the same direction on the same mountain the day that this was revealed. God, I pray that the people will go home being thankful that God has granted this grace to them. I only spoke it, Lord, through permission. And I only say it through permission, Lord. And let the people be so grateful that they'll never try to do that sin again. And may they never try to do any sin but love you with all their hearts. Lord, make these families happy. And may they grow and raise their children in the admonition of God. For my message that was on my heart is delivered, Lord. I've done all I know how to do. And Satan has fought me for weeks and hours without sleep. But now I've commanded, Lord, to these people that they study it and go and live for you. Grant it, Lord. It's off my shoulders now. They're in your hands. I pray that you'll bless them. Bless these handkerchiefs, Lord, that's just been set on here for the sick and afflicted. May this night be one of the greatest powerful nights that all the people will be healed. Grant it, Lord. Bless us together. May we go in peace, happy rejoicing, because a God of creation has showed us since the beginning and has extended to us in our mess that we're in His grace again in this last days. Oh, great and eternal God, how we thank you for it. And may our hearts be so happy that we'll never have another desire to sin against you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love him. Why shouldn't you love him? I love him because I say it now so the ministers will understand. This is to them that follows this message only. Oh, are you happy? I told you the truth, thus saith the Lord all the way through. Now let us stand and raise our hands as we sing it again. I love Him. I love Him for His grace. I love Him for His mercy. I love Him for His Word. And the Word of the Lord came to the prophets. Ah.